Uh, thank you, and thank you for, for coming. Uh, my name is Rod Earlywine. Um, I'm currently the interim superintendent for the Sioux City Community School District. And what led me to apply, um, to be very, honest, be very honest with you, is my experience thus far with the Sioux City Community School District. It's been a very positive experience for me. Um, I came into this position with, with a lot of questions as the interim. Um, I, um, being from Sergeant Bluff Luton and, and there for 27 years, I was having a lot of knowledge about Sioux City School District, but I was not knowledgeable about the district, meaning I didn't know a lot of the, the, the t details associated with the school district. And what I've learned over the past seven months is this is a very, very good school district. We have great staff. We have people that truly care about the students and they want to see our students succeed. And with that, um, I want to continue to be a part of this school district. Our second question, what do you consider to be your greatest strengths as a superintendent? I believe my greatest strengths um, is my ability to work with a wide range of people, to work um, in situations where trust needs to be built, where healing and mending needs to happen. Um, when I became the superintendent of Sergeant Bluff Luton, um, administration was over here, staff was way over here, and I had to work very hard to bridge that gap, to build that trust, and to build those relationships. And I believe my greatest strength is, is building relationships and building that trust with not only the, the staff, um, but bringing administration and staff together and building that trust within the community. In your research of this community and school district, what are the challenges you will need to address immediately? Um, some of the things that um, we've been addressing already, and that is the climate and culture. Um, when I came into the, the district, I was, I was aware that the climate and culture um, were not the greatest. Um, spent a lot of time watching board meetings, watching what happened at board meetings. Um, and obviously that's a good indication of the climate and the culture of a school district. Um, again, being close to Sioux City at Sergeant Bluff Luton, very aware of the climate and culture. Coming into the district, um, it became very aware that um, trust is an issue, relationships are an issue, and again, those are things that I believe I'm very good at, is building that trust, building those relationships, and healing and mending, and getting people to work together. We're all here for the same reason and that's for our students. And that's what we have to focus on and that's what we have to remember. In your previous positions, what have you set in place to ensure responsive customer service for students, employees, parents, and community members? Customer service is, is, is critical and it's important. First of all, we have to identify our customers. And when you're in a school district, your most important customer are the students that we serve each and every day. So what we have to ensure is that we have quality programs in our schools, that we prioritize where we spend our money and how we spend our money, and we focus on our students and student achievement. And we have to look at all of our programs and evaluate them. Um, schools sometimes, a lot of school districts, once a program comes in, that program never leaves. We just keep adding to it, and the, we add some more to it, and then we add some more to it without getting rid of some of the things maybe we shouldn't be doing any longer. So customer service should be focused on our students and serving their needs and making sure that we're doing our very, very best each and every day for those students. What have you found to be the most effective communication and engagement strategies for both internal and external audiences? Communication is, is critical. Um, internally, the best communication is face-to-face, person-to-person communication. 
That's why I try to be out in the buildings as much as possible. I try to be visible in the buildings. We meet with uh, the building principals. Um, I say we, associate superintendent and myself, quarterly to get into the buildings. While we're there, we meet with the um, building principals and talk to them about what's going on in the building. We also try to get into the classrooms when we're there. And when I'm out and about visiting the buildings, I try to pop into classrooms um, when I can. Um, and what I see going on in the classrooms across Sioux City Community School District, um, I've seen great things happen. I've never been in a classroom when I went, oh, what, what's, what, what is that all about? I go in there and I went, wow, really great things are happening. It's good to see students engaged um, with their teachers, the teachers uh, teaching, engaging students, working with the individual students, working in small groups. Um, I think that's important. With, with the outside um, community, it's important to, um, we've updated our website to try to keep that information flowing, um, communication out to, to parents um, early in the year when we had the big changes concerning the discipline policies. Um, when when pe teacher, excuse me, when parents reach out to me through Let's Talk, I'm very responsive to them. I answer their questions, get back to them as soon as possible. Um, but the best type of communication is face-to-face, -face, in person, engaging people. Um, that's what I'm good at. Just a reminder before I ask the next question, if you have a question you would like to ask, please use the note cards to write your questions, put your name on it. If you hold it up, uh, Leslie will pick it up and uh, uh, we'll hopefully be able to answer all the questions you may have in the time we have. The next question for Dr. Earlywine, if selected as superintendent, what are the first steps you would take to ensure your successful transition to this position? And I, um, I guess I'm a little ahead of that game right now being here for, for seven months. Um, as the interim, and again, what I've tried to do is start to form positive relationships. Get out in the buildings, speaking to teachers, speaking to students. One of the things that I did when um, early in the year after the new cell phone policies came out and high school students were, were affected mostly by them, I met with each of the high school student council and just to get some feedback from them. We were a month into it. I wanted to hear from them, get their thoughts, their views on how things were going. Um, and believe it or not, um, several of them supported the new policies and they, and they liked it simply because they said, now we're, we're talking, I'm talking to my friends. My friends are talking to me. We're not just sitting there and texting all the time. So that was really positive and something that I, I enjoy getting out and, and talking to students. Um, some of the best time in the district is when I get into elementary buildings at lunchtime and speak with students while they're, while they're at lunch, especially at the elementaries, because you get some really good questions. And uh, they're, they're, um, they're interested, they're curious about me, what I do, who I'm the boss of. Um, so we have some really good conversations, um, or I have, I've had some really good conversations with the elementary students. What process would you recommend for establishing district goals and priorities? What role should staff, students, parents, and community members play in determining those district goals and priorities? Um, yeah, we, um, as far as the community and parents are concerned, we, we, we need to sur survey them and we need to provide them with data and information. Um, staff, needs to be involved in, in the goal setting process and it all has to be based on data. What's the data telling us? What is the, the, the discipline data telling us? What is the student achievement data telling us? And we have to look at that data, not just one source of data, but multiple sources of data over time and figure out what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, and what are we gonna do to continue to improve our strengths and really focus on our weaknesses and areas that we need to improve. When we look at that, when we talk about students, we're really talking about student achievement. And student achievement 
across all of the grade levels, all of the subgroups, the different ethnicities that we have in this district, you know, and compare them to districts like us, districts not like us, and comparing one group to the other. And how are we doing? Are we, are we making a difference? If there's big gaps and big differences, why are there big gaps and big differences? And what is our plan to make the improvements that we need to make? What actions would you undertake to support and encourage good teaching? Good teaching, that's, that's what it's all about. Right? If we want to improve student achievement, we have to in, improve good teaching. We have to give our staff the tools that they need. We have to align professional development with areas that we perceive as being areas that need improvement. So quality staff development that is not just a one-shot staff development, but a staff development that is implemented over time with fidelity, with follow-up. We're now going to move to questions that have been submitted. Um, uh, please share your, your vision for our district. You may have covered other questions, but certainly add. Sure. Um, whenever we talk about a vision, a, a vision really needs to be a, a shared vision. Right, because I could have my vision, you can have your vision, but when you talk about a vision, what you really want this district to be, that, that should be a, a shared process and a shared vision. What I believe it should be is a place where parents want their kids to come. It should be really work on being a destination dis district. And for that, you have to have a lot of things in place. We have to have great facilities. We have to have great teachers. We have to have great administrators. We have to have great support staff. And we really need to work to be a district where people want to come and they want to stay. And we have some challenges ahead of us. And as, as we all know, with, with the voucher system, that, that's going to that's going to change things. Um, but if we're going to compete, we have to get better. And we can't shy away from competition. We have to strive to be the best school district that we can be, the best school district in the Siouxland area. That's when people will want to come, people will want to stay, and they will want to live in this community because this is a great community. We have a lot of great things going on. How will you address serving all students in an equitable manner? Yeah, equity. What, what, what does equity mean? Right? That means we are fair and we are impartial. And we meet students where they're at and we give them everything they need so they can be successful. Doesn't mean equal. It means equity. Fair, impartial, students have the opportunity to, to come. Everybody has access. One of the, uh, a book that I'm re recently reading about three-fourths through it is Ruthless Equity by Ken Williams. And, it, and it's a great book. And that is something, to be honest with you, that I know I need to continue to work on professionally. I need to understand equity. And I need to understand the diverse population that we have in this school district. Because we do have a diverse population. And we're becoming more diverse all the time. You know, 4% of our students right now are immigrants. We have um, big increases in our Hispanic population over the last 5 to 10 years. We've had big increases in our black community, black student population over the last 5 to 10 years. Those, that's where we're growing the most. We are a minority majority school district. About 44% white, 36% Hispanic, 
8% black, 3% Native American, 3% Asian, and then a few others. But we're not going to be less diverse in five years. We're going to be more diverse. So what are we doing? Are we planning for that? Or are we just waiting for that to happen? I prefer, prefer to predict and plan and make sure we have the ability to meet those, the needs of our students. Wherever they come from, whatever language they speak in their home, it shouldn't matter. How much money the parents make shouldn't matter. What matters is we're meeting the needs of each and every student to the best of our ability each and every day. If we do that, we'll be a Destiny School District. Again, we're into your questions now. We've got quite a few really good ones. So hopefully we can get to as many as we, we can. I'm trying to uh, ask them in the order they've been received. Um, what is your leadership philosophy on health and wellness for staff retention and recruitment? Yeah, that's, that, that's a big one. Um, there, are less, there are less educators getting in the field today. There are more educators getting out of the profession each and every day. So we have a lot leaving and we have a few coming in. So we are competing for teachers, quality teachers to fill many positions. There are a lot of high needs area. The state a few years ago, they started a list of high need teaching areas and it was a short list, four or five. Now the list is 10 or 12 of areas that are, are short. Used to be able to, you know, social studies teachers were, were easy to find. You could fill those positions quickly. Elementary teachers, you know, at, at Sergeant Bluff Luton, we had an opening, we'd get 120 applicants. When I left, you're lucky to get 15. That's a problem. And there are other areas. I know districts there, um, industrial tech, that area is hard to fill. In Sioux City, we right now we have about 25 teaching positions that are open. We haven't been able to fill. Seven of those are special education teachers that we haven't been able to fill. So high needs areas that we need to work hard to recruit and retain, and we just have to stay after it. We have to make this an attractive district. And part of that is climate and culture. That's a big part of it. If people come to a district and they feel like they are valued and people appreciate them, there's a good chance they'll stay. So those are the things that we can work on and, and we, can, we can make big improvements in those areas. You mentioned that you have a strength of building positive relationships. How have you started to create a healthier school culture um, as an interim superintendent up to this point? Sure, and um, again, I, I think that's one of my strengths. Um, and the, the, the only way that I know how to do that is to talk with people, sit down with individuals, have those discussions. That's, that's how you build a relationship. I, I can't build relationships through email. Maybe so, if someone can, they could show me how, that'd be great. But I just don't think you can do that. The only way you can build relationships is you gotta get in the buildings, you gotta talk to people. You have to talk to the teachers. You have to talk to the administrators. We have to talk to the support staff. We have to let them understand and know that we do appreciate them. And, and you know, this is a, it's serious business, but it's not life and death. So we also need to have a little fun at work, right? We need to have, be able to, to put a smile on our face and to greet people, and to treat people with respect. And we need to be able to agree to disagree without getting defensive. You know, if, if I'm doing something wrong or, or, or I have an idea, you know, and you don't think it's very good, then challenge me on it. I, I should be challenged. Because the only way we're gonna make improvements is if we ask questions and we work together and we agree to disagree on some major topics. 
but by working together, we can make a big difference. What is your experience in special education, and are you aware of Iowa as a whole has been failing to implement IDEA for five years now, and what are your plans to ensure Sioux City Schools will be a good partner and follow the federal law that benefits the students? Yes, special education, that's something we're tackling right now. That's not something we're waiting on. We already have a task force working as we speak. Task force includes administrators and teachers getting together. We got together as a whole group, um, K-12, and then we broke apart into elementary, middle, and high. And we're looking at how we provide services to our students, how to make sure that we're meeting IDEA. That's a big heavy lift. And you top that off with being short seven special education teachers, it gets complicated. But the only way we're going to make improvements in those areas is to involve the people that are closest to the problem in helping to solve the problem. And those are the teachers and the building administrators. Those are the people that are in the trenches doing the work. And we have to include them. I could sit in my office and develop this great plan in my mind it'd be a great plan and try to implement it but people won't buy into it they won't own it we need to develop a plan that people will buy into people will own people will be a part of and feel like they are a part of it it's not being done to them we're doing it with them and we can make a big difference if we use that model in most of the things we do in public education Given the fact that the Sioux City uh, District is a minority majority, how do you plan to engage parents from different socioeconomic backgrounds to actively participate in their children's education? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question because some of the time, or a lot of the time, the people, um, depending on their, their ethnic background, depending on their socioeconomic status, they, they, they shy away from the buildings. They shy away from being involved because many times they didn't have a very good experience in school. So it's not something they're, they're, they're comfortable in, in taking part in. One of the things we're doing, or we're doing I think we've done a, a, a very good job of, and, and Dr. Young is leading that, um, and that is our, our equity committee. And we're really looking at equity and we're looking at the subgroups that we have, and we're looking at data, student achievement data over time. Why are our Hispanic students not achieving to the level of the white students? Why are the black students not achieving to the level of, of the white students? What are the differences in that groups with student achievement? What are we doing, uh, what are we, um, as far as discipline, and we're looking at disproportionality with discipline. So if 44% of our students are, are white, about 44% of our discipline referrals should be white students. If we have 8% um, of our population black students, about 8% of our discipline referrals should be black students. And it's not there. We have disproportionalities associated with that. So why is that? Why is that and what are we doing about it? An achievement gap question. There's an education gap, especially with students of color. What are your plans to address this gap? Yeah, and, and that goes back to the equity committee. First of all, you have to realize that it's there and acknowledge it. You can't just say, well, it's, it's there because we, we can't do it. We can't make excuses for it. We have to say there is an achievement gap. This subgroup, whatever the subgroup is, is underachieving compared to other students. So what's the plan? What are we doing about it? And we have to look at the data and then we have to work on strategies and plans to make sure that we are addressing the issues that we identify and that we're not hiding whatever those issues are. We have to make sure we're very transparent in those issues and the subgroups and who it's affecting. 
When you spoke about phasing out programs that are no longer working efficiently, what are some examples of, of this happening in, in the school district? What programs would you strive to eliminate? Uh, that's a great question. I, I, I don't know, I'm not that deep in the weeds yet with, with Sioux City on, that, on specific programs that we would, would keep or, or, or not keep. I can tell you that at Sergeant Bluff Luton, we had some programs we put in place. Um, we put in place a program, a math program, illustrated math, um, like six years ago. And we followed it and thought that implementing it was going to improve scores, did a lot of resource be, re, research before we did, and it wasn't making a difference. So our plan was to phase that out and do research and, and bring another program in that is effective because you cannot continue to do the same thing over long periods of time and get the same results. I mean, we can't, we can't do that. Sometimes you have to realize that, you know what, it's not a good program. And then you have to make the change. Even though some people might really like it, that doesn't matter. How does it affect the students in the room, in the classroom each and every day? Is it making a difference in their student achievement? Or, or is it? I mean, that's the question. Is it making a difference or is it not? If it's not, we have to move on and do something different. A very current question. Now that the governor has signed the private school voucher program into law, what impact do you foresee for this district and how would you adjust to a funding decrease? Yeah, that's, that's the unknown, right? The unknown is how many students um, will choose to leave and go to a private school and how many will stay. And to be honest with you, the whole funding issue is, is as clear as mud right now because a certain amount of dollars for every student that's in private school will come to public school. They act about $1,200 of the funding would stay with the public schools. The rest would go to private. Um, but we haven't really seen any details of that yet from the, from the governor's office. So that's, that's a problem. So right now, to be honest with you, is, is it 100 students? Well, you take 100 times, will we lose 100 students? 100 times $7,500, that's the amount of money we would lose. So this is gonna take some time to figure out. And the, the bigger issue that I think we're going to face is because of more money going to private schools, that I believe was going to be less money coming to public schools. The, the pie is only so big, there's only so many dollars going there, um, so something's got to give. And it will be interesting over the next couple of years. Three year phase in, year three, all private school students are eligible for the health savings or the, 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 the savings account, educational savings account. Um, so it will be interesting to see. Um, right now, I would say that currently the private schools that we have in our area, um, they would not be able to take all the students. You know, there, there'll be a capacity at some point in time if it, if it comes to that. And to be honest with you, I'm not afraid of the competition. We, we have to get better. If we want to retain students, retain teachers, we, we have to get better. We have to continue to strive to get better and to meet the needs of our students. If we continue to do that, we're not afraid of the competition. We welcome it. The problem is we're not playing by the same rules. The accountability, the transparency, it's, it's not associated with this new bill and this new law. We're still accountable. We still have to be very transparent. Private schools don't have to be. And it's, it's not part of the Iowa law that was recently passed. Great. Thank you. In your time at Sergeant Bluff Luton, you were one of the only neighboring districts that chose not to, part to partner with the uh, Sioux City Career Academy. Why did you make that choice at that time, and what are your current thoughts on the Career Academy and its future? Okay, that, that's a great question. Um, it's not that I was against the Career Academy. There are great things going on at the Career Academy. At Sergeant Bluff, we worked very, very, Sergeant Bluff Luton, we worked very, very hard we had to form our own career academy. 
and we developed over 50 pathways for our high school students in, in different tracks, different pathways. And we worked very close with Western Iowa Tech to make that happen. So no students at Sergeant Bluff um, were left out of any learning opportunities as far as Pathways and Career Academy was concerned. We had it all set up. Here, here, was, here in lies the problem. This goes back a long ways. When the Career Academy idea was first brought up, I met with Dr. Gosman, um, also uh, with uh, Tim Greaves at the time, who was the head of the AEA, um, and also with Western Iowa Tech, um, Dr. Mural. We met, we even looked at some buildings on what we were going to do and how we were going to do it, and we were, it was going to be a regional career academy. So we looked at some things and it got to the point where, um, and this is my opinion, my view, is Dr. Gosman just wanted to get this done. So Sioux City did it. And the other schools on the outside, Sergeant Bluff Luton, Hinton, Lawton Bronson, Woodbury Central, um, Westwood, were just kind of out at that point in time. So, which caused, in, 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 again, this is my opinion, so it, it caused some issues and it, be, and it became political. And um, <clears throat> so what we did is we, we created our own pathways at Sergeant Bluff Loop. We did what we thought we had to do. We had the welding, we have health science, um, the business pathways, um, we, we, we have it, you know, 50 pathways that we created there. So now that I'm on the other side of the fence at Sioux City, um, I've visited, I've been in the, the Career Academy many times. There's some great things going on in the Career Academy. It, 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 it's awesome. Now, could Sioux City absorb all the kids that wanted to go there in those programs? They, they couldn't. We, we, we wouldn't be able to. Um, service all the students. So we had at Sergeant Bluff Luton, we focused and we went through Western Iowa Tech um, for those career pathways. Sioux City um, had theirs and they're, they're awesome. Um, we have students coming in, a few from South Sioux, um, 15 or so from Dakota Valley. They work, worked hard to get, you know, cross state agreements. You know, I applaud Dr. Gosman for getting that done because that's not easy because states are very territorial when it comes to education. Um, but there's, Sergeant Bluff doesn't have kids attending Sioux City Career Academy. Um, Hinton, I don't believe, has kids attending. Lawton Bronson doesn't have kids attending. Woodbury Central, I think, has a couple. So there's, there's a long story there, but what I'm telling you now, as the, the leader of this district at this time, I'm very supportive of the Career Academy and we've already had some meetings on how we can get Western Iowa Tech more involved because I think they should be more involved. In other areas, the model is the community college has taken the lead on this and that's not the model we have. So we're trying to work on that. Dr. Mural is very open um, to listening and to working with us to make it more of a regional academy, but right now it's, it's not a regional academy. What are your feelings on civil rights education within the framework of history? <laughs> that is open-ended. Uh, civil rights, so are we talking about critical race theory here? What are we talking about? That's, uh, that's really a, a, a broad question and I'm someone that taught uh, American history for many years. Um, but, but teaching civil rights, I mean, we, we, you know, we have to teach history, right? The reality of history. And we have to be real about it and honest about it. So civil rights is, is part of our history. And the lack of civil rights or the battle over civil rights, it, it's part of our history. Shouldn't all of our students know about our history, good and bad? 
Otherwise, we're going to repeat the same mistakes we've made. So, in my opinion, you know, we just whatever we teach and we deal with history and civil rights, just need to be open and honest about it. You know, it's not all, it's not all pretty. We all know that, but we have to be honest about it. We can't tell a you know um, fake story about it. We have to be again honest forthcoming and this is our history. American history isn't all all great. We had some tough times in our history. We just don't want to repeat those really nasty bad times. How will you ensure the safety of our students and faculty in regards to active shootings? What have you done? Yes, all of, um, that's a great question. That's something that you know, uh, in, in the student group I talked with today, that's something that they brought up to me as well, a question that they had. What we've done is uh, we all of our staff have been trained in active shooting scenarios and given um, training on what they do. Um, Sheriff Sheehan um, with the county volunteered to come in and do the training and work with our staff. So they have options <coughs> if they're faced with that unthinkable um, you know, and this really, you know, kind of hits closer to home all the time, right? We just had one in Des Moines. And, you know, I got that message yesterday and why, why kind of what it hit me pretty good because I have a daughter that teaches in Des Moines. So I get the message. So because I hear a teacher shot, two students, that's all I know. So I'm trying to call her and she's not answering. Of course, she's busy. Um, but, you know, and the shooting happened a block away from one of her schools that, she, that she's an instructional coach at. So those things, not a lot of things keep me up at night, but school safety and shootings in schools are one of the things that, that really bother me. What we can't say is it would never happen here. We have to plan for it. We have to prepare for it. You know, back in the day when you, you know, um, you did the old atomic bomb uh, safety drills where, what'd you do when I was a little kid? I, I got under the desk, right? Um, we have fire drills, we have tornado drills, now we have active, active shooter drills in our schools. So it's something that I, that I think about. Again, I worked with Sheriff uh, Sheehan to provide training to all of our staff. And he does an awesome job. That's something we need to do every year. Um, and we'll work very closely with them to uh, make sure that that's done. What do you view as the role of the superintendent in overcoming the negative public opinion of the school board? Great, thanks for that question. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, right? It's, it, it's true. Um, here, here's what I'll say to that, is that people, uh, you know, when I, they, people from across the state, my colleagues that I know, um, when I, they found out I was going to take the job as interim superintendent, they're like, why would you do that? Have you seen the school board meetings? And to be honest with you, I had, because I went back and I watched a lot of them. And what I will say is that school board meetings should never be a source of entertainment for people to watch. They shouldn't be. So to work with the school board, um, I think you've seen some difference already. Some, some calming, some you know, settling of the waters, so to speak. Um, and I think my, my personality and my leadership style um, helps with that. I mean, we, we can disagree on things. That, that's fine. We can disagree. But we, we should be civil. We should be respectful. Every school board meeting that I've been to in Sioux City, we have high school kids sitting in the audience. So what kind of message are we sending them if we as adults don't model being respectful to each other. We can disagree, it's okay, but let's be civil. 
since you've already retired from your previous superintendent position, are you viewing this as a short-term job or a long-term possibility? Um, it's a long-term possibility. Um, and people have asked me this question quite a bit. Will you retire? I never, ever said I was going to retire. I resigned from Sergeant Bluff Luke. I didn't resign because there were bad things going on in Sergeant Bluff Luton. I didn't resign because the board didn't want me around anymore, the community didn't want me around anymore. I resigned because I felt I needed to do something different. I needed another challenge. I needed another opportunity professionally. Could I retire? I could. I don't, I, I'm not ready for that. I still have much more to give. And I will give everything I have if I am chosen to continue to lead this district. I, I enjoy it here. It's, it's a good place. There are good people. We have some really good things going on. We're already tackling some really tough issues. There are more, more to come. But I, I, I never retired. I'm not ready to retire. When, when I'm ready, maybe I'll know it. Maybe somebody will tell me. Um, but I never said I was going to retire. I, I was looking for other opportunities. I never dreamt it would be here. This wasn't even on the radar. It wasn't even a, an opportunity when I left, when I decided to resign at Sergeant Bluff. It became an opportunity. I took advantage of the opportunity and I've enjoyed it. I think we're a good match. I grew up in Western Iowa, um, graduated from Mon Damon West Harrison, um, right by the Missouri River. Um, I'm Iowa born and bred. Um, I understand, um, I really think I understand the community of Sioux City. Um, and again, I, I think we're a good match. What role do you see for arts curriculum, including music at both the elementary and secondary levels? Yeah, music is, in, arts and music are important. You know, which one of us in here doesn't listen to music pretty much every day? And that's something that, that people were probably at, at Sergeant Bluff when I first became superintendent, um, is ah, he's all about sports. But what I did as the superintendent is we committed $25,000 every year for out of um, one cent sales tax to go to buy band instruments. The big instruments that, you know, they're 2,500, 3,000, 5,000, we, we committed that. When we did a big um, remodel of the high school, one of the areas that I said we have to tackle is the music area. Now if you go down there, the, the, the band room is state of the art. It, it's a beautiful, it's huge, it's big. It, before the band and the vocals shared a room. But we added, put a big addition on the Sergeant Bluff Luton High School for band. And it's a, it's a beautiful facility. Acoustics are awesome in there. So I'm very, very supportive of music and the arts. Um, we have kids. I, I'm a supportive of all extracurricular activities. Anytime we can have a program where kids are actively engaged in, actively involved in, around positive people, that makes a difference. It makes a difference in their lives. Because they, they, they're committed to something. They're dedicated to something. And they're involved in something bigger than themselves. They're involved in a team. And I think that helps them grow you know, as people. In your previous district, uh, it only had they only had 20% free and reduced lunch. Sioux, Sioux City Community School District has 60, 67% or higher rate. Uh, how are you qualified to adapt to that difference? And what are your suggestions on how to deal with the poverty challenge in Sioux City? Yeah, the poverty is is an issue. It is true. Sergeant Bluff, low low social economy, right? We all know that. Sioux City, right, 66, 67% free and reduced lunch. But that should not be a, a, a barrier, should not be an issue for providing quality education to that group of kids. If, if I walk down the hallway, I don't know which kids are, are free and reduced, which ones aren't. I, I just see kids. And I see kids that 
um, you know, that, that need a quality education. They need adults that really care about them. So being you know, one socioeconomic group or, or the other, um, I guess my um, best way to say that is I was one of those kids. You know, you grew up in Little Sioux, Iowa. I was number five of five. My dad worked construction, um, dirt construction, heavy equipment. Guess what, in the winter, there's no work. It's called unemployment. And then when I went to school, if you were on free and reduced, guess what you got? You got a different color lunch ticket. You got the yellow ticket. Everybody else that wasn't on that, they got green tickets. I had a yellow ticket. You think everybody didn't know who was on free and reduced? Think my friends didn't know? You didn't think that caused some problems for me? You didn't think we had some issues on the playground because of that? And in the bathrooms because of that? We did. So I can certainly empathize with those kids. But that shouldn't be an excuse that they can't do better, that they can't achieve. They're kids. Let's treat them all the same. Give them all equal access. Give them all equal opportunity. It shouldn't matter. What is your role? Uh, what, what is your role in the lobbying of uh, our elected officials, especially at the state uh, level, to impact positive changes for our public schools? Yeah, we have uh, uh, we had one form already with the Sioux City Community School District that we sponsor. We have another coming up this Saturday morning. We invite them in. Um, I send them emails. Obviously, I send them some emails concerning the vouchers. I wanted to express our, our my opinion as the the superintendent of a, a public school district, and especially one um, that has a lot of private school opportunity within it. Um, I, I speak with them um, at those forums. Um, try to get them to understand our perspective and why we need this or why we'd like to have that or why they should vote no on this. Um, and again, it, that, it comes down to relationships. I can't just go to them when I want something or when I don't like something. You have to form that relationship. And am I not happy about the vouchers? I'm not happy. But am I going to just throw my hands up and say I'm not talking to you ever again? That, that doesn't work. What works is if I continue to work with them and continue to form a relationship. And we have a lot of new people. So that's going to take time. Relationships take time. Trust takes time. But I do communicate with them. I do talk with them. Again, this Saturday morning, 8.30, at the Educational Service Center. There's a forum. We invite them to come. And, and, and we talk to, to them about educational issues and things that, that, that we see. How do you plan to improve and address student behavior? Student behavior, that is something that um, we put some policies in. This was, policies were, were put in place when I walked in the door. Um, they are board policies. So those are things that, that I need to support as, as a superintendent that administrators have to implement and follow through with. Um, not everybody likes them the new policies, but um, I also don't like students not being engaged in class because they're on their cell phone. I don't like that. I don't like being in meetings when someone's on their cell phone instead of being actively engaged in the meeting. I don't like that. Because that's telling me you're not engaged. That's telling me you really don't care what I have to say. Kids have enough distractions without being on their cell phone throughout a classroom. Why, why is that necessary? Why, is it, why would it be okay for a kid to play games when we're in a math class, or in a social studies class, or in an English class? It doesn't make any sense. It's okay to put them away. Between classes, great. At lunch, great. But during class, we should be engaged in active learning. It's not okay. And we need to make sure that the administrators then, the teachers and the administrators, are following the policy. And when a kid's not following it, we need to call them out on it. Kids 
kids know where the bar is. They pick up pretty quickly on it. They know what they can get by with and what they can't get by with. And most of the kids, 90 some percent of them, will follow the rules and it will not be a problem. But you have some that are going to be a challenge. And they're gonna challenge not only cell phone rules, but they'll challenge other rules. But for fair and consistent, kids will respond. Thank you. I, I've been doing these community forums for quite a while. You've really written some good questions. We didn't reject any of them, but unfortunately we've run out of time because Rod has to get uh, down to his board interview. Uh, also, he's gonna spend some time with the press um, so people will get some exposure there. So he has one last question. It's kind of a lightning round. Uh, uh, one minute answer to, as our students are our first and top priority, priority, what is or will be your recommendation for staff retention with the economy being what it is? One minute. One minute. Um, staff retention, that's something that, that is important. Again, because like I said earlier, we have people leaving, not a lot of people coming in. We want to keep our people. And if we can improve the climate and culture, that will go a long ways to keeping our people. If our people feel valued, valued, if they feel supported, that goes a long way to them wanting to stay with us. If they don't be, feel valued, they don't feel supported, then it becomes a problem. But there's some things that we can do. There's some little things we can do. One of the things we did on a last teacher work day is we gave a, a, a flex afternoon that work from home in the afternoon if you choose. And I think the teachers appreciated that. They're professionals. Let's, let's treat them like professionals. There's some things that we can do like that that will go a long way. And, and teachers, they will acknowledge that. And they do appreciate things like that. And when I ever deal with, with those things, I always think of, you know, from a, from a teacher perspective, because I still see myself as a teacher. I still see my, as, myself as a coach, because that's what I do each and every day in working with administration, administrators. That's, that I'm still teaching and coaching. So if I can view myself as still as a teacher, put myself in their shoes, that's the way I try to look at it and try to make some improvements, some little things. Um, if we can do that, um, a gesture that the board did the other night is trying to pay some of the, the high insurance increases that are coming at, at, at the teachers, try to take a little bit of that bite away from, from them. The board passed that the other night. Um, so I think the teachers will appreciate that as well. But climate and culture is critical, in, especially in education, because we are, we are relationship people. Thank you.